I, I have so much hope for our future. I think there's starting to be a shift in how we, we relate to nature and that people are starting to realize we got to stop destroying forests, especially the Amazon rainforest. And we, we need to pressure the governments and, and, and have the corporations to not only take um, into account the economic growth, but also the environment and human health. And I think we're starting to see a shift that way. So uh, there's still time. There's definitely still time to to save the Amazon and, and our future doesn't have to be one of a story of extinctions and, and pandemics, etc. Welcome back to the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin, and thank you so much for tuning in today. Today, I have a returning guest on the podcast all the way back from episode number 14. I think that was almost four years ago now, which makes absolutely no sense when I say it. But we have Jana Bell on the podcast today. Jana is the founder and president of the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. Surely, if you are a regular listener, you know what the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy is because I mention it almost every episode. But for those who don't know, the ARC is a charity that I support with the podcast. So I donate a percentage of the YouTube earnings as well as $5 for every Animals at Home t-shirt or sweater automatically gets donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. And at this point, we've raised about just under $2,000, which I'm super proud about. For me, keeping reptiles is not just about keeping the animals. It's also about making sure that we're participating in conservation in some way and that we're using the animals to allow people to connect with nature and have a respect for wildlife. But also, we should be actively participating in conservation in some way. There's, it's, I think it's just important that we do that. And if you aren't able to donate to a charity just by watching the podcast and absorbing the content, you are going to be making a difference because I do send some of that money to Amazon Rainforest Conservancy, which is really cool. And so in the episode, we discuss how Jana got started with this. What was the impetus for her actually starting a conservation? How difficult is that to actually buy land in a foreign country? We discuss the projects that she's working on. We, there is a, a parcel of land in a lowland section of the rainforest, as well as into the cloud forests in Peru. Many of us are familiar with the cloud forests. We've talked about that quite often in the podcast is a very special ecosystem that are being decimated right now. We discuss all the illegal activity and how hard that is on not only the people there, but the, the environment itself and some of the amazing future projects they have in the works. So this is a really important episode for me and I, I really do hope you enjoy it. Again, it's so important that we are... are, are, are that we're working on conservation in some way. I think I, I personally think it is just crucial uh, being a reptile keeper that you participate in some way. And if, if the only way you can participate in conservation is by listening to that this podcast, this episode, that is, that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. For those who have a little bit of extra money to spend and you want to support both, you can buy an Animals at Home t-shirt if you want, or go right to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy website and make a donation. They will be very appreciative of it. And as you listen to the passion in Jana's voice, you will know that the money is being well spent and it's being utilized in a way that's protecting the areas of the earth that we are passionate about. And that's what I love about this episode. If you're looking for more information on this episode, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. You can find the show notes there for all the episodes as well as the links for everything that we talk about in this episode. If you would like to help produce the podcast, you can head to patreon.com slash animalsathome. All the Patreon supporters really does go towards me being able to create this podcast, pay for the editing, pay for the server space and whatnot. And I do really appreciate that. Without the people on Patreon, the podcast would just not happen. It's just as simple as that. So thank you very much. If you do want to join us there, you can do that. Thank you so much to Custom Reptile Habitats for sponsoring this podcast. If you're looking for new reptile enclosures, make sure you head to the affiliate link in either the description or the show notes there. You can find high quality, large enclosures for your animals, which really, really does make the difference in their welfare. Another really simple way you can help support the podcast is simply by sharing it on social media. Let's get some new listeners to the show. I would really appreciate it. Let's jump into the episode. Enjoy. This is Dr. Chris Jenkins, CEO of the Orianne Society and host of the Snake Talk podcast. We are pleased to announce the launch of our new Hudson Berkshire Turtle Conservation Program. Turtles are one of the most endangered groups of animals on the planet, and the Orianne Society aims to reverse this trend by working to conserve 
Blandings, Bog, Spotted, and Wood Turtles in one of the most critical regions in North America. The Hudson Berkshire region of New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Massachusetts is the only place in the world where all four of these turtles occur and their populations and habitats are declining. A generous donor is helping us launch the Hudson Berkshire Turtle Conservation Program by matching the funds we raise during our Long Live the Turtles campaign. If you care about turtles or restoring wildlife habitat, please consider supporting our efforts by donating today and having your conservation investment doubled. The campaign runs until World Turtle Day on May 23rd. Learn more about our program and how you can get involved at www.orian.org. Well, Jana, welcome back to the podcast. I'm so excited to have you here. So thank you for coming. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, I think I, I should have looked before I started recording to see how... I know it was in 20... I want to say 2019 when we recorded the last one. So it was a very long time ago. I, I know it was episode 14. That just sticks in my head. So this will be episode around 158, I think. So Wow. Yeah. So it's wow. been a, a lot of things have happened since then. Um, I think when we first talked, I don't think Animals at Home had even made a donation to to animal or to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy yet. It was just part of the vision. And and now um, we've raised you know a, a decent amount of money. So I'm super excited about that. We can talk about that later. But why don't we give everybody a refresher? Because there's a ton of new listeners since the 2019. And and why don't we just start with you know who you are and, and what inspired you to start the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy? So uh, Amazon Rainforest Conservancy is a registered Canadian charity that I established in 2014. And the backstory is kind of interesting um, because I had no plan <laughs> to start a Canadian charity. Um, but going backwards, in 2011, a friend of mine was celebrating a milestone birthday and she wanted to do the trek to Machu Picchu. And her husband had already done that uh, trek with his first wife. So she invited me to join her. And I had been a stay-at-home mom for 10 years. And I was so excited. I just needed an adventure. Uh, at that time, I hadn't even heard of Machu Picchu, but I didn't care. I said, yes, sign me up. I'm coming with you. Then I looked at a map to see where we were going. And I saw that we were going to Peru. And that right next door to Machu Picchu was the Amazon rainforest. So I called my friend and I said, listen, we're never going to be back down there. Can we add on a quick trip to go and see the Amazon rainforest? And she said, sure. So we uh, went to an eco lodge. We just stayed there for two nights, three days. But the Amazon, there was something about it that just really uh, spoke to my heart. And I'll never forget the first time I stepped off the boat Um to walk the path to the lodge we were staying at. And just uh, like there was so much going on between the, the macaws screeching and there was monkeys howling and there were these beautiful butterflies fluttering all around me and then the leaf cutter ants marching below me and these huge trees that were being strangled by vines that looked like huge snakes. It just seemed so unreal. I felt like I was on a Hollywood movie set. So... There was something about the Amazon that spoke to me. And when I came home from that trip, I just knew I had to go back and explore some more. Uh, so I went back a few months later, but this time uh, my guide wanted to show me what was really going on, not what the tourists see. And so um, I saw all the, the devastation, the, the destruction. I went and visited um, illegal mining camps and saw how they were turning the rainforest into desert landscape. I watched this beautiful... Uh, ironwood tree that was at least 500 years being chopped down by loggers and it literally took literally took uh probably five minutes for the chainsaw to slice through this huge tree and the, the crackling sound it made it it was falling and then the thud when it hit the ground i felt like i was watching a murder <laughs> it was yeah. horrible um and then i saw these roads that were being built that were slicing through what was previously remote and inaccessible areas of the Amazon, areas where people live in a voluntary isolation. Um, I just couldn't believe what we were doing to the lungs of the planet. So when I returned home from Canada from that trip, I decided I need to do something. I, I need to get involved. Um, and I looked for a Canadian organization doing conservation work in the area that I had visited. 
which was Tambopata, Peru. And there wasn't one. And so that's what propelled me to start my own. Wow. So when you went back the second time, did you, A, did you go by yourself? Were you just planning on going to explore more? Like what was the, the obviously you wanted to go experience the, the rainforest again. So there was a high motivation to do it. But what was your plan going in? Was it just to explore more? And then you, you, you know, were exposed to the cruel realities of what's happening? Or was that, were you kind of going there to, to, to look for that as well? No, I just knew I'd only spent three days. So I contacted the guy that we had at the lodge. Gotcha. And I said, hey, I want to come back and, and explore more of the rainforest. And he was the one who said, come back and I'll show you what's really going on. Wow. Yeah. Wow, good, good call on his part. Yeah. It's amazing, amazing how some people and their actions and decisions can actually change the course of your life. Yeah, that's incredible. So, so okay, so at that point you're like I'm going to do this. What, what what does one do, you know, when I you know, it sounds like a great idea to to start saving the rainforest, but how do you even what's the first step? Where do you go from there? Right. So the first step was I realized in order to to um get donations from people, I had to be able to issue them a tax tax receipt. Um which means I had to be a charity. So I um applied to the Canadian government and uh, it was the Harper government under at that time, and, and the Harper government was not friendly about ish, issuing charitable status. Number one, they saw it as taking away from their tax base, mm. and number two, uh, they didn't want to issue to an organization that was doing work outside of Canada, especially in a country like Peru, which is known for its cocaine production. So, right. It was two long years of me providing reports and data and plans and I'd send it to them and they'd sit on it and then they'd send it back and ask me for more information. And this went back and forth for two years. I think they were just trying to tire me out so I would give up. Um, at one point, my, a friend of mine said to me, you know what you need to do is you need to go down there and you need to film what's going on and show them. And so that's what I did. I hired a a cameraman with a decent camera, and we filmed the the mining and the logging and the slash and burn farming. I uh, brought the the footage back to Canada. I had a friend of mine help me edit it into a short documentary. Sent it off to the government, and within a few months, they came back and said, "Okay, we will if we will issue charitable status," which was so exciting after so long of trying, but also really scary because that meant I had to actually do something. Yeah, now. yeah, yeah. Now that's just the beginning. Yes. So uh, I have a couple of questions just to decide what's the easiest way to go for it. I guess the first thing is, as far as those illegal activities that are happening in the rainforest, you know, there, there's from the West, it's easy for us to look at it and say, hey, they, they shouldn't, you know, why are they cutting down the forest? Why are they doing slash and burn? Why are they attempting to, you know, illegally mine? And I think we talked about this last time you were on, you know, these people are, are just fighting for survival as well. In a lot of ways, it's the only way they're going to get paid is by practicing these activities. Are, are there... Are there ways for those people that are doing those illegal things? Are there other ways that they could make money? Like, does it is it is it just kind of us going in and stopping them from doing it, and then they're sort of out on the street? Or what, what's the situation with with those people that are practicing those things? Exactly. What, what the way I see it is, there's sort of two groups of people. There's people that are just trying to put food on the table for their families, and there's if there's no other legitimate job, then they have to go and cut down wood or do some uh, mining. And those are the, the, the people that we really want to work with and help them find sustainable, other sustainable livelihoods. And there are, there are definitely, and those are, and I can talk about that uh, a little bit in the future, about our future programs, because we have some pilot projects that we want to um, launch this year on, on helping communities where our projects are move from logging and mining and poaching and, and slash and burn farming to more sustainable livelihoods like beekeeping for honey, growing bamboo for sustainable wood, growing vanilla for, for vanilla production. So that's one sort of category of people that, that we really want to work with and partner with to make some huge social changes and environmental changes. Then on the other side, you have the criminal gangs and the mafia and those ones we, we, we just can't. Um, not only work with, but just that's that's a really tough, tough, tough spot. 
yeah, you can't really tolerate that. And, and I think I remember you saying last time how you know how dangerous some of these activities are, especially the the mining the gold. Right? There's a lot of mercury poisoning and things that are happening not only to the area but also just to I think it was mercury, not only to the area yeah. but the people that are you know that are doing this. They're just people that are trying to put food on their table, and they're actually probably giving themselves incredibly lifelong hazardous issues. Yeah, it's it's a real environmental um, catastrophe down there right now because the miners do use mercury and the scientists have come down and test have tested just the hair samples from people in Madre Dios and their their mercury levels are way beyond what the World Health Organization um, deems acceptable and and you can even you just see there's so many children being born with with developmental issues because mm-hmm. um, it's all in the fish and everybody eats fish there and it's just it's in the whole food chain. So yeah, it's pretty scary. Yeah, that's very scary. So fast forwarding, you 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 have your your charitable status. What, what the next step obviously is purchasing land to conserve. How, how do you do that? So I hired um, a forest engineer. Actually, I didn't hire him. He 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 volunteered to come with me to look at land parcels. Uh, he's now my executive director. His name is Darwin. He's a fantastic guy. Anyhow, so this is back in 2014, and I went down and we traveled around to to look at all different parcels that were available for purchase, and in different regions. And everything we saw, I I fell in love with. This is it. And he kept saying, "No, no, it's not special enough." Um, and so I eventually had to go back to Canada, and maybe a few months later, I got a a, a message from him. I found the land. I found the land, and he he sent me a picture, and he was standing by this huge tree, which he told me was a cedar tree, a type of cedar tree, which he had thought had been totally was gone from the Amazon rainforest, been cut down for for its 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 wood, um, and he thought he don't he'd only seen them in, in photographs, so he couldn't believe he actually found one that was still alive. And it had a big number 11 spray painted on it because the owner was planning on chopping it down. Wow. And then on this land, because it's in very remote area, he, he found like the den of armadillos and he found the tracks of, of giant ant eaters and jaguars. And he was just thrilled with how pristine the land was. And so that was our first purchase at uh, 616 hectare, which is about 1,500 acres, uh, Brazil nut concession because there's about 100 Brazil nut trees on it. Wow. And so who owned that land before? In this area of the Amazon, you can't own land in its entirety. The government owns the land, but what they do is they issue the title to people. Gotcha. And people can sell the title of the land. So we purchased the title of the land from this lady um, back in 2014. Okay. Yeah, and so um, there's I think there's another side to that story that we'll get into maybe a little bit later with with that particular chunk of land. Um, yes. So that was your first piece, and maybe you can bring us up to date where we are now as far as I think there's been a few more par- parcels purchased, and I know there's it's amazing to see you know all the pieces falling together and the the plans moving forward, and I, I we will talk about that as well. But where are we as far as how much land that uh, Ark actually has protected? Okay. So we, what we want to do is we want to expand into different ecosystems in the Amazon rainforest because this would allow us to protect a wider biodiversity of plants and animals and especially endangered species. So our Brazil nut concession is in the lower Amazon basin, uh, Madre de Dios. Right now, I'm going, I'm going back to visit it in, in, on April 14th, and we're actually going to go and visit a neighboring uh, concession that they're willing to sell to us. And it's huge. I think it's uh, 1,500 hectares, which is like 3,000 something acres. So it's, it's huge. Um, and the reason why I'm so passionate about the Lower Amazon Project is because it's a region where Brazil nut trees grow. And Brazil nut trees are the king of the jungle. They tower over all the other trees and they can live to 500 years. Scientists think maybe even a thousand years. Um, the amount of carbon they store is unbelievable. They're just mm-hmm. such an incredible tree. And the local communities can harvest the Brazil nuts um, as, a, as a livelihood and it doesn't, doesn't harm the tree. So that's that project. In 2022, we launched a new project in the cloud forest of the Amazon rainforest. And that's in a whole different region. That's in northern Peru. Um, and we have so far purchased five parcels of land, um, totaling 140 acres. 
Um, we're right now negotiating with, I think, four other neighbors right now. It's a slow process because the area that we're focusing on is, is in this valley and it's the land is all uh, is carved into small parcels owned by individual families. So it's a much longer, slower process to acquire uh, a larger conservation parcel. And, and as far as how the land is priced, I mean, people are you know, typically talk about properties in North America when you're buying like a chunk of land or something. Is is it price per acre and is it is it fairly similar across Peru as far as the or, or when you go up into the cloud forest are the values of those titles a lot higher or is there a difference? Yeah, it's it's very similar to Canada or even you know what province you're in depends on what region you are is what the prices are. Okay. Yeah, so prices do vary. And, and can you give us an idea of how much purchasing a title actually costs for some of these parcels? Okay, so in the cloud forest project we're actually it's not a concession we're actually purchasing the land itself. Okay, okay. And so for that it's Probably for one acre costs five hundred dollars Canadian. Okay, so it doesn't that seems pretty reasonable actually? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it, yeah. it's a, it's not that it's not too outrageous. No, not at all compared to, to you know buying land in Canada. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, w- one thing that I I find interesting for yourself is as far as your history goes, were you like an animal and nature person growing up? Or is this something that you've kind of grown into? Because when I hear you talk, you sound like an, an like an absolute nature person. You sound like anybody who's listening to this podcast, the same sort of you know mindset, some tinkering with bugs and, and animals and whatnot. Is that who you were to begin with? Or did you grow into that? I think it was always who I was. Um, I mean, I grew up in Toronto, a, a metropolitan big city, but I did go to overnight camp and, and my grandparents' cottage, which was when I was able to really... Um, experience nature and fall in love with it. Um, yeah, I've always been a huge animal lover. Uh, my older brother is, is severe allergies. So we, we were ne- never able to have pets growing up. And every time he used to bother me, I used to go to my dad and beg to trade him in for a cat. <laughs> 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 I was serious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's always a bit of love there for wildlife and animals. Oh, always, always, always. Yeah, I've always remember as a, as a kid, you know, loving looking at the birds and, and, and the raccoons and whatever. Yeah. Because going into, you know, the middle of, of the rainforest, it doesn't really matter how much of an animal person you are. That, that is a pretty big, it's a pretty big extreme, you know, like even if you like pets and work even on a farm and whatnot, getting dumped into the middle of mother nature is a whole other world. As far as wildlife around you, we're talking about insects, mosquitoes, predators, animals that can kill you, venomous snakes and whatnot. Um, was that, was that a transition for you? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> yes. Every time I go, it's a different, if it's a different adventure. Yeah. Um, yeah. You see different things um, and you're challenged differently. Uh, especially the insects are probably what really challenged me the most. Um, but you I'm just sure. kind of, you have to sort of accept it. As, oh, we, when we were looking at different um, projects, to, uh, to start in, in the cloud forest region, we went to this one project, um, and what we didn't, we arrived there at night, and, and what we didn't realize until the morning that was a huge wasp nest on the hut where we were staying, and um, so the people that owned the land decided to knock it down, and then we were surrounded oh, God. by these wasps, and it was cr- like so. They said, "Stay in your tent." until they go away with, they, they weren't going away. Um, but the interesting thing was someone said to me, if you go out and, and are all stressed and flap around, then they definitely will sting you. But if you just go out and be calm and just walk, you know, as if they're not there. Uh, and it, it, was, it made such a difference. So there was people you could see that were, ah, and they were getting stung. And I was just like, no, no, <laughs> I'm friends. We're friends. <laughs> I didn't get some ones. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel like the bugs would be, I mean, even I, mean, I saw a picture of you with, there's a tarantula on one of the walls, I think in like a little lodge or something that you're staying at. Like that sort of stuff is, it takes some time to get used to knowing the fact that you're sleeping and anything can kind of come up to you at any time. Yes. Yes. And actually everybody has tarantulas in their kitchens, including us now, because uh, they eat the um, cockroaches. <laughs> oh, and see, the ecosystem, it works every time. <laughs> So 
I know one of the newsletters that you sent, I think maybe at the end of 2022, you were talking about just the instability in, in, in Peru. And, you know, it's there is political instability there. So that is traveling there quite dangerous now or is it difficult to get in and out of? So I was there in December when it was it, it was a, a, the state of emergency. Um, and because the protesters were were um, taking over the airports and shutting down the roads. Um, so I, everyone said to me, you better get out now or you, you could be stuck here for, for months. So I was able to get out, um, before things got really crazy. And they did, especially in where our, our lower Amazon project is based because the protesters there, they, um, block the main highway that connects that town, Puerto Maldonado to the rest of Peru, meaning no food could come in, no gas. Um, the whole area was paralyzed. Everything was closed, government offices, stores, um, and it was very dangerous to be on the streets because of the protesters. Then the governor of, of Madre Dios uh, uh, called on the military to come and remove the protesters, which really angered them. So they all swarmed his house, which is a couple streets away from where our office is. Wow. And they were throwing rocks and breaking windows. And then they actually tried to set his house on fire while he was inside with his family. Oh my God. So he responded by opening his bedroom window and started shooting at them. <laughs> so wow. It was insane. It was insane. Yes. That is, yeah, that's, that's scary. And that was a protest against the, the current government, right? Is that what it was? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And things since then have calmed down, but they're starting to gear up again um, because there is so much corruption in, in the government and people are just, they want constitutional change. Um, the government just recently issued uh, a palm oil company uh, rights to a huge area in the jungle, an area where indigenous communities live. Um, so people are really upset about that and starting to protest. Um, and you have your, your legitimate people who are protesting for legitimate reasons, but the other, you also have a huge group of people, uh, the criminal gangs, um, terrorists, who are protesting just to ca cause chaos. Yeah, that is a really tough situation. And as far as the just your everyday local, are they pretty con... Do they have a sort of a conservation mindset? Like, are, are they proud of the Amazon rainforest in their home country? And do they do they want to protect it? The sad thing is the education system in Peru is, is one of the worst mm. in the world. It's awful. Um, and so people there aren't educated about the Amazon rainforest. So they just think the whole world is the Amazon rainforest. So if they right. destroy, you know, this corner of it, it doesn't matter. There's just so much of it. Mm. Um, so that's really sad. And the other thing too is a lot of the, the people from the Andes are coming down to the rainforest because it's living in the Andes. It's re it's a tough, tough life and really hard to make money. In the rainforest, there's lots of resources that, that you can exploit. And so the people coming down uh, are just chopping down all these trees to create um, area to do their, their, their farming. And what they don't even realize is some of the trees they're cutting down are actually really valuable. They could actually sell them, but they're just burning them. Wow. Um, so, and the other crazy thing is in the schools, the children aren't taught about the animals of the rainforest. They're taught about zebras, elephants, <laughs> giraffes. It's just craziness. Ah, that is weird considering they have, like you said earlier, the most biodiverse area on the planet, really. And some of the most incredible wildlife that you could ever want to experience is right in their back door. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. Do you have any wildlife experiences from being on the land that you that are that stand out some animals that you've seen? I know you've obviously interacted with lots of primates and monkeys and whatnot. And are there any that stand out of moments that you're proud to have that land and have that animal protected? Well, I think the latest one is with our new Cloud Force project, we um, installed camera traps. Mm -hmm. And we had seen, because the, one of the main focuses of that project is jaguar conservation. And we, we installed the camera trap. And within a week, this beautiful, healthy, gorgeous jaguar strolled right by our camera. And we were like, yes. <laughs> That's amazing. Yes. Well, and and the, the cloud forests are interesting and people listening, there's lots of people that are very familiar with that ecosystem. There's, there's because of its, you know, it's becoming a rare ecosystem on earth. And there's many people that work with reptile species from that area that are trying to conserve them in captivity because of how quickly those areas are shrinking. So it's a really special area. So it's, it's great to hear that 
you know, Ark is actually has a hand in protecting that as well. And, you know, another area, a piece of the rainforest that you kind of mentioned as well is the indigenous people. There are people that are still living as authentically as you could live in the rainforest. And that is a whole other dynamic of conservation that's very almost strange to think about that the fact that there are people you know in north america we want to conserve land we have national parks and whatnot but it's not like there's people in there living like they have been for thousands of years and that's one of the things i've always wanted to have a project working in partnership with an indigenous community um which is not easy to do because they don't trust foreigners and they don't know arc and and but fortunately um my executive director, Darwin, he has a, a really uh, good relationship with a, an Indigenous um, a community. And he's asked me on this trip to go and visit. And they've asked uh, for me to come and visit them and talk to them about um, partner, partnering with them and, and helping them. Um, so I'm excited about that. I'll have come back from that trip with, with lots of stories. But yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. So, so tell me a little bit. I mean, obviously, there's different chunks of land that you have to travel to, whether it's the cloud forest or or uh, the lowland projects. But what is it like to get to those areas? It's obviously not just a quick Uber ride to get dropped off. Our Brazil nut concession is in a really remote, pristine area, and that one's uh, it takes about a day and a half to get there by boat. Uh, there's no roads there, um, and it, it, yeah, yeah, it's 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 a trip to get there, and that's why when when COVID hit. And or even before COVID hit, when the government was cracking down on the illegal gold miners closer to, to the towns, they all dispersed to more remote areas. So when we first purchased our land, there, there were very few gold miners up there. Now, they're, we're surrounded. And part of the problem is, because we're so remote and it takes so long to get there, it's hard to get support from the environmental police because... They don't want, they want to sleep in their beds at night. They don't want to have to camp on our land. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's so being remote has its pros and cons. Definitely. The Cloud Forest project is, is much easier to get to. It's probably about an hour drive from, from, uh, Terrapoto. And then it's a three hour hike up the mountain to our first parcel of land. And, and are there, I think on the lowland project there is, but are, are there places for you guys to stay? Like what structures do you have there? I know, I think there is a structure on the lowland project for sure. Is it just, um, like, what does it look like? There was a structure on the lowland project, but mm. it was taken down and stolen uh, during the pandemic. Oh. Everything was stolen. Our buildings, our boat, our motor, every our generator, everything we had was stolen. So we, we were restarting from scratch. So did you not know that until you got back there? Correct. We figured we'd heard that there was that, that our land had been invaded by illegal gold miners. So, but we so we figured, yeah, a lot of things would be gone. We didn't realize that the structure they'd actually take it down and, and move it to somewhere wow. else. Wow, that must have been yeah. so frustrating being at oh. home in Canada, wow. knowing that that's probably taking place and there's just nothing you can do about it. I was devastated, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to start a new project in, in a different area because I thought if if we can't reclaim our Brazil like concession, then yeah, we need to be somewhere else. Um, so how difficult was that? How, how you know, you, you show up after COVID, the place has been decimated. There are presumably people on the land illegally gold mining. How, how do you go about clearing that and, and re- reestablishing the, the conservation? Well, there was even a problem before we were able to visit the land because once, once the pandemic, um, the restrictions lifted, uh, we wanted to find out from the government, you know, we wanted to see if we could find out from the government what was going on in that area, if it was safe for us to even go, because we've been hearing reports that it was a, it was a very dangerous area now. Um, and it, the government responded by telling us, we don't even know who you are. We have no record of you. You don't have a Brazil concession. Um, because w- what was going on with the lady we had purchased it from was in the process of selling it to somebody else. Wow. So she somehow remained the title owner or as far as, you know, created fraud documents or something? Everything in Peru is still paper. Nothing's online. So she presumably made a deal with somebody in the government office and destroyed all the paperwork. Oh my God. So showing that we had purchased it from her. So it looked like, yeah, she was still still the owner. So she was going to do a double dip situation and sell it twice. She was... (laughs) Exactly. 
exactly. <laughs> exactly. So we reached out to the people that she was selling it to because she started all the, all the government paperwork. And we said, hey, hey, we want to let you know, uh, she's actually, we're actually the owners. So you might want to halt right now. Anyhow, it took us a year uh, pressuring the, the local government because they knew, we knew that there was corruption in their office. This is why it was happening, uh, which of course they didn't want to admit to. But I mean, I keep everything. So I had copies of every paperwork. Um, and then I heard the most amazing lawyer, Luis, who's a bulldog. And then Dara was visiting them all the time. And then this past December, all three of us went there and uh, we just really we pressured them. And finally, they gave us back the concession. Wow, that is stressful, yeah. especially because you've done that. all that work, all the money to just that's gone towards protecting that piece of land. And just that's part of the establishing the, the, the charity to begin with is, is having that land. And it could have been erased just like that. Yes, yes. And sadly, that's, this is a typical story in Peru, which is why a lot of people go there, try and start a conservation project, or maybe not even a conservation project, their own whatever project. And it's just so difficult. It's just so challenging because of all the corruption. Um, I mean, just everybody there knows the rules aren't to be followed. You right. Just do whatever you want. So, yeah. Will it be different with the cloud forest parcels because you're actually owning the land or is it just as easy for them to shred the paperwork? The cloud forest project is in is in the province of San Martin, which is a lot less corrupt than Madre de Dios. Okay. So. Hopefully yes. it's not as, yeah. It's, it's, okay. So then after you've done the battle, you got the land title back or, you know, reclaimed it for for yourself and then you go to the land and there's nothing there what, what and and there's probably people on the land that shouldn't be so what's the what's the steps there so yes darwin and our our one our forest guardian um gerson went up there we, first we had to buy a boat again <laughs> and they went up there and they walked the concession uh it took them a while because it is so large but they actually found 11 illegal mining camps on our land wow with people there Mm -hmm. So Darwin, he's amazing. I mean, the courage. He talked to each of the heads of the mining camp because each mining camp had about six people. He talked to each of the heads of the mining camp and he was very polite. But basically, he just said, listen, we are restarting our conservation project here. Uh, we're not saying you can't do your gold mining. We're just asking you respectfully not to do it on our land. Yeah. And for the miners that saw him coming in and dispersed into the forest, he spray painted on their on their tents leave no mining here um so then uh some of them uh left peacefully uh he returned i guess about three weeks ago and found that there's still five mining camps okay and this trip he returned with a lawyer and a, a government official from the forestry office because a lot of the miners that stayed were saying to him, we don't believe you. You don't, you're not, you know, you don't have, you don't own this land. So with the government and the, uh, the lawyer, they showed the, the miners, here's the paperwork. He's not lying. You need to leave. Um, or the next step is that we have no choice. We will have to bring the police up to arrest them. Right. And we told them, we don't want to do that. We want this to end peacefully. Um, so we're hoping that they've left all of them. Um, that's one of the reasons I'm going back down in, in a week is, is I'll go up with Darwin and, and a team of people and uh, we will see who's left. And then we'll have no choice but to to bring the police up. Well, it's got to be pretty dangerous for Darwin to just be going up to those camps too, right? Because like you said, some of these are actual crime syndicates that are running these operations and uh, who knows what they're willing to do to continue mining. It's really dangerous. They're all armed and we're not allowed to be, number one. Is that a government rule? No, they're armed illegally. No, no, sorry, sorry. I know, yeah, I know oh, they're illegally, yes. but but you guys, why can't you be armed? That's just uh, that's one of the rules there. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Well, obviously, you don't want to be in a situation where you're shooting at people anyway, but still, like the, <laughs> the, the fact yeah. that they're armed yeah. and that makes it uh, a lot harder for you to clear their land when you have uh, like a pocket knife or something. Yeah, yeah. We're walking around with our machetes, and they're walking around with with their rifles, and and they are trying to be intimidating. They came yeah. to our, our where we set up our our temporary camp until we build again. And they intimidate, they were trying to intimidate. Um, we had a family living on the land and they, we just, we, we, we've removed them. We just thought, no way. These guys are, are yeah, some of them are just too dangerous. And, and when they do this gold mining, is it mostly 
through the river? Like they're not, are they panning for gold or like how much gold is actually in there? Cause it's not like they're doing like big excavations and digging it out. I don't think. In this particular area, there's a lot of gold in the form of gold dust okay. by the riverbanks. Uh, and what they do is they make huge craters with um, uh, power, those big, I'm not sure what you call them, the big, big hoses for water. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they just blast away the bank. So, yes. And make huge, huge holes. And then they sift, sift, sift through all the earth. Put it through the, their machineries. They, they've got this is this is one of the reasons that it's hard for the hard for us to ask them to leave, is because they have these huge machines on our land, and for them to remo- remove them is going to be very difficult because they got them there, but somehow on this. It's crazy river, that they even got them there. I know. I'm not. We don't even know how the heck they got them there. Yeah, the huge machine machineries, and then they use the mercury to separate um, the sediment from the land uh from the from the gold dust and then they burn the that burn the mercury off so they're just left with the gold so wow. yeah they're making a huge mess and it, it there's it's such an incredible uh the devastation they're, they're causing is so incredible in major deals you can actually see it from space wow yeah like just the gold mining <laughs> do, do you think that's more of a devastation than the deforestation or are they pretty equal as far as damage in Mentor de Dios, the, the, the main devastation is, is the illegal gold mining. And I guess it has the lingering effect of the mercury. I mean, at least with deforestation, over time, the rainforest will heal itself, trees will grow back. And not, not that it's an ideal situation, but mercury is going to sit in those waters and in the ground and in the animals for potentially, I don't know how long, but years. Yes. And that's what we don't know. That's what we don't know. How long, uh, yeah, what, what's the long-term impact of all this mercury in the environment? Yeah, that's sad. And so when you do go back to that land, you know, they've <laughs> dismantled your your home there. Will will you guys go as create something else, another structure or is there already a structure being made? No, right now we're just focusing on getting out getting the miners out of our land. So we're just we've got our tents on beach on the beach. Okay, <laughs> so when you go back in April, you're going to be tenting it. Yes. <laughs> And then, wow, that's an extreme camping. <laughs> <laughs> usually we tend it, but usually it's on a platform with a roof. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is uh, right in the elements. Yes, yes. So uh, there's some a few other things that I know that I, I was when I was reading the newsletters and whatnot you sent out that are just like projects that you guys have on the go. One of them is agro f- f- agroforestry. Ag- yeah, agroforestry. Can, can can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. So we haven't measured. Totally, since we we're waiting for the miners to all leave, but it looks like we have about probably a hundred acres of land that has been devastated during the pandemic um, by the illegal gold miners. Wow. So what we want to do there is rather than just plant trees, we want to do a, an agroforestry project, which means we plant the native trees, but under the trees we also plant fruit trees. Uh, which will provide fruit for our forest guardians, number one, and fruit for the animals and birds. Uh, we can also plant cacao under there, which is a for, for growing for, for chocolate. Um, another really exciting thing that we, we want to do, it's going to be a pilot project, is we're, we want to grow, we're going to plant bamboo in these areas. Because if bamboo would be a sustainable wood, sustainable um and if bamboo will grow really well in these areas that have been um devastated by the illegal miners then we will have a whole new project uh to help recover these areas and also that people will be able to uh, make a livelihood from that's amazing i i feel like that's where a lot of the conservation is going to go or, or even just you know farming in general should should start to head. I think we're we all know the issues with these monocropping, even in North America. You know we're just devastating the land by just fertilizing it like crazy and and just destroying the soil every year, turning it over and and killing the the microbes in the soil. And I think people are starting to move towards more of a like a holistic version of farming that in, in includes animals and and not disrupting the land as much and and realizing that that's actually going to be more productive because we haven't completely exhausted the land. And that's what's really cool about these you know a, a, a you know like a situation like ARC because you can kind of play with those things and you're not actually worried about profit overly. You're just sort of testing it to see if this will work. And if it does work, that'll have huge implications. Exactly. Exactly. And oh, we're really excited about a pilot project that we're going to launch in the cloud forest. 
because in the cloud forest, that's where all the orchids grow. And one of the orchids is vanilla. And vanilla mm. is native to the Amazon rainforest. And it grows, it can grow on trunks of trees and it doesn't harm the tree. And it doesn't need fertilizers. It doesn't need pesticides. I just love it. Um, there's a huge demand for vanilla and the supply is really low because it's a very labor intensive crop. You actually, ha- a person has to actually uh, pollinate it, each one. Oh, wow. So not only would it, would it create jobs, there's a huge demand for it because I think the last I read is only 2% of vanilla is actually natural vanilla. Mm. The rest of it is artificial vanilla yeah. that we buy. Which makes sense. I mean, if you find natural vanilla in the store, you're like, wow, that is expensive <laughs> compared to like the artificial stuff. Yes. It's, just, it's like 10 times as much, but it obviously tastes better. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I actually had no idea that that vanilla was an, an orchid. So that's another really interesting project. And w- what about the, the bamboo? Does bamboo already grow there? Like now, I'm, it, I know... I feel like bamboo is an, an Asian plant, but I know I've also seen it growing in the rainforest. I don't know if there's like a like a new world version of bamboo that's similar, or is it just the actual Asian plant that grows? That's no, been there's over. native. Yeah, there's native bamboo to to South oh, America. Okay, yep. okay. Yep. So yeah, that, that I mean that's a huge resource, and it grows fast, and it can be cut down and regrow quickly. Exactly. Yeah, that's amazing. And uh, what about the macaw nesting? I know that was another project that. Oh uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the macaws are the macaws are in the Lower Amazon Rainforest Project. That's the area that, that they live, and um, they've really faced a, a population decline in in the past couple of years, mostly due to deforestation. Um, they really rely on this tree called the ironwood tree, which has been logged almost to extinction because of the value of its wood. But they rely on the ironwood tree because it um, forms cavities in its trunks, uh, which are the, form the nesting site, the dry nesting sites that they need, uh, that they use for decades. And those cavities only form in old, old, old growth trees. So once they're cut down, uh, there's, they don't have any more nesting sites. So one of the things that we want to do is we're going to make wooden nesting boxes for the macaws and then put them up in our trees. Um, and so what's one of the things I'm bringing down for, for Darwin on this trip is all the climbing gear that he needs because he has to go way up high. And <laughs> yeah, Darwin sounds like a badass. Darwin is unbelievable. <laughs> You'll have to actually, you should actually interview him. When I would time. love to. Yeah, I would yes. love to have him on. Yeah. Is he Peruvian or is he from yes. Canada? He's no, no, Peruvian. he's okay. Peruvian. He's Peruvian. Okay. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, he sounds like he's a jack of all trades when it comes to conservation. Oh, yeah. And he loves everything else. He loves the snakes and the frog. In fact, he was just telling me today because we chat, we talk every day. Um, and he said, you might want to mention that there's, and you might have heard of this, there's a fungus that's really affecting the frogs in the mm. Amazon rainforest. And uh, there, yeah, there's, I, I don't know specifically, but that is a pretty common f- problem with, with, with frogs and amphibians for sure. Okay. So this is more recently that it's ha- happening in the Amazon. And he, he said, the first time he saw a frog that would basically been eaten by this mushroom, he, wow. couldn't be- or the, he couldn't believe it. And he says, now he's seeing it more and more and more. And there's actually scientists that are now there trying to figure out what's going on because they don't think it's a natural thing in the proportion that's happening right now. They're not sure if it's, if it's related to pesticides or deforestation. But yeah, it's pretty scary. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how all those things sort of exist in the ecosystem. But then when you destabilize something in there, you have one of these you know, antagonist that just sprouts up and starts to take over because whatever was keeping it down is no longer there. Like, you know, probably could be dis- deforestation or, or some disruption in that stability of the ecosystem. Exactly. The balance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and what about the, w- when you talk about reforestation, because I think that's another area that maybe you guys, not only just the agroforestation or agro, am I saying, yeah, agroforestry, but the actual reforestation. So, you know, re- reestablishing the forest. How do you even go about doing that? Do you, do you have to collect the, the, the nuts and the seeds and from the trees and then you're just trying to replicate what's already there. Yeah, that's interesting because we'll have to do a lot of reforestation in our in our cloud forest project. Um, for that project, we are purchasing land in the valley between the two mountain ranges of the Cordilla Escalera. And the issue is, this is actually an interesting story. Um, there's 170, 170 families living in the valley and they were all growing uh, 
coca. Um, and coca has a really rich social, cultural, and medicinal significance there. The leaves are chewed. It's almost like a stimulant, like caffeine. So we have a really hard day, you know, in the forest. It, it takes away your, your appetite and gives you energy. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're also used for milestones, like coca leaves are given as a gift for, you know, births and weddings. Um, and the, the leaves of the plant in its natural state is, is not harmful. Uh, the problem is when it's um, crushed into a paste and then chemically refined, the end result is cocaine. Right. So all the families in this valley were growing coca for the cocaine farmers mm. or for the cocaine barons. And in the 1970s, yeah, they started in the 1970s growing uh, coca for the cocaine barons. In the 1980s, the U.S. government decided to have their war on war on drugs, and so uh, they sponsored the United States sponsored the Peruvian Air Force to go to regions where the coca farmers were growing their coca and spray their crops with you know some nasty chemical to, to basically kill everything. So all the coca in this valley was destroyed. And then the Peruvian government said to each family, you have a choice. We can either give you enough cacao seedlings to grow, uh, was it cacao or coffee? Sorry, I can't remember exactly. Either it was co- coffee or cacao. Mm. We'll give you enough seedlings for, for say, one hectare, or we'll give you one cow. And 90% of the families chose the cow. So then the whole valley was made into a cattle pasture for all these cows. The issue is, it's causing a habitat disfragmentation because all the animals that are on one side of the mountain, they have to climb down the valley to get to the other side of the mountain. Right. And especially the jaguars, as they were coming down, were getting shot on sight because the cattle... Cattle. Yeah, they, they, they feared for their cattle. There's a real opportunity for us, which is why we decided to launch a project here is because a lot of the cattle ranchers are, are older and retiring and their children don't want to take over being cattle ranchers. They want to live in the city and... And so we have an opportunity here where we can buy their land and um, they retire from, from cattle ranching. And we, so we, we have a lot of land we're going to need to reforest. Wow, that's amazing. So, so then how do you go about uh, doing that? You just pick the plants and go from there? No, first you have to kill all the, all the grass, the cattle grass that they... So our oh, first okay, that's, they've actually planted that grass. Yes. Not, okay, gotcha. Yes, yes. Wow. So this grass is not native to the Amazon they planted for their cows to eat. So we have to choke out that grass and we do it with um, some native lagoon plants. So first we have to plant all these lagoons, which will choke out the grass. And then we plant trees, fast, fast growing trees to provide shade. And then once there's some shade, then we can start planting the more native trees that grow a bit slower and get bigger. And so it's a, it's a long, huge process, but it's, it's pretty exciting. And things do grow fast in the Amazon, which is great. But that's one of the things what our, our forest guardians do as they're patrolling our lands. They're also looking for native uh, seeds and they gather them. And then they, we built a nursery. They take them, they plant them in our nursery. So they become seedlings that then we can plant on wow. our areas that were deforested. That is, that <laughs> is so cool. I know. Well, so when you when you continue to come up with these new projects or Darwin brings you new ideas, is, does each one just fill you with excitement? Like you're smiling right now as you're talking. I can tell how excited you are. It just sounds like it's you're actually really enjoying this. this oh, work. I love it. I mean, I love it. It's just so fabulous. And I should mention, Darwin is the executive director of the Lowland Project, the Brazil Nut Concession. The Cloud Forest Project, I have Cindy and Sam, who are absolutely fantastic. So I have two different teams. Um, and what I'm doing this year is I'm br- going to bring Darwin to see the Cloud Forest Project. I'm bringing Cindy and Sam to see the Lower Amazon Project. Um, but yeah, I have such an amazing team and they have such fantastic ideas that, yeah, it's really exciting. <laughs> it's so exciting. Yeah, that's tell. amazing. And, and one other project that I think is just in the works or, or just the ideas on the board is the Headwaters Project. Is yes. that something that, uh, that it's in the future for ARC? Yes. Uh, one of um, the board of directors of Art Canada had visited uh, this particular region in Peru, and it's it's called the Headwaters. So it's where the the Andes meets the the Amazon rainforest, and it's a very special area. Um, 
because it's a a unique combination of mountains and and highlands and peat bogs and species that only live in this particular region. There are species that only live here in the whole world. They only live here. And there's this one hummingbird, and I can't say the name of it, but it's got a really fancy long tail. And they actually thought it was extinct, but we they, they they found some and people come from all over the world to try and see these these mm. beautiful hummingbirds um anyhow the area that we're we're focusing on has a beautiful waterfall it's called gokta falls it's it's a huge huge waterfall and it was a very remote area that was not connected to the rest of peru very very poor um and this German explorer in 2006 was traveling around Peru looking for, for new finds. And he came across uh, these falls and took pictures and, and brought them back and showed the world. And now it's becoming sort of the newest hot tourism spot in Peru, um, like the next Machu Picchu sort of thing, uh, which is pretty scary because it's getting all commercialized. Um, developers are eyeing it and they're, they're look, they want to build condos and roads and hotels. And we really want to get in there and make sure that there's a, the conservation, we can do a conservation project. So at least part of that region can be saved and kept in its natural state. Yeah, that, that's the challenge, right? You, you want to strike this balance between, you know, Obviously, ecotourism is a huge opportunity for the people there and a, 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 a area for business that doesn't destroy the forest. But then if it goes too far, it just becomes like an Americanized um, theme park and exactly. it, it ruins it. Exactly, exactly. And that's why we're, it's taking a while because we want to work in partnership with the community. Uh, and they are all really excited, of course, about all this money that they're making with tourism. And what we're trying to, to, to work with them is say, yes, we can do tourism, you can do tourism, but there's a way we can do it sustainably. Um, and this is sort of our one opportunity that we can do that. Mm-hmm. So when you go in April, what's the plan? I think you, you already mentioned a few things. How long will you be there for? And is it are they open-ended trips or do you always book a return flight? No, I always book a return flight because I miss my pets and my oh, yeah, kids yeah. and my friends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you have to come home at some point, but, yeah. but you, you, you go quite often. I go quite a bit, yes, yes, but I usually go don't go more than three weeks. I don't like to be away from home that long. Um, I mean, my kids are in their twenties, but still, so you want to see <laughs> them still. again? I yeah, yeah. I have a life here that that you know. Well, not only that, I have to raise all the money. Well, so yeah, there's a lot yeah. to do in Canada for these projects. Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, that's one thing with the charity is you're probably always worried about cash flow and paying things, and then I know everybody at Arc is a volunteer. And that still doesn't make it easier, really. You still need money. Yes. So everybody in Canada is a volunteer, but in Peru in the two projects, uh, so we, we I've got the salaries of the forest guardians, the executive directors, the project managers, uh, you know, the cost of reforestation for launching the pilot project. There, I mean, there's there's lots of costs for sure. Yeah. So for this particular trip, um, I'm going to visit both the projects, the Lowland Project and the Cloud Forest Project. And I'm also, as I mentioned, going to visit the Indigenous community to see mm-hmm. if there's something that, that our Canada can do to support them and help them. That's awesome. You know, and, and one thing I, I talk about on the podcast all the time is that when I originally approached you and ARC to, to have the, uh, you know, to be able to donate openly to, to the charity, the the response was what many conservationists give to reptile keepers is that you know reptile keeping is kind of destructive and and there's a lot of really bad things that come along with it so i sort of understand that and so i am so appreciative of the fact that we've been able to make this connection and that i've been able to cultivate people who think are like minded like myself and like minded like you people who are very conservation focused and there's people listening to this podcast right now who will be working with species that are from that area or roughly who are working on conserving them or preserving them right you know in in some ways if uh, if we lose an animal in the, in the natural habitat the only way to keep those animals alive is is in captivity and it's just been a great experience for me to to have that connection and to know that people keeping reptiles and listening to the podcast and watching the videos or buying shirts and whatnot are actually actively supporting you and your project. I mean, all you have to do is listen to this episode to know how passionate you are about this. And it's just been so cool. And I know I know listeners have even reached out totally on their own and actually mm-hmm. made donations to ARC as well, which has just been so cool to hear about. Yes, I love it. Yes. 
Yeah, yeah. So it's 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 so fascinating. Um, is there anything else that we didn't mention today that that you wanted to say before we before we let you go back to Peru? Oh my goodness gracious! Uh, I don't think so. I think I, yeah. I think we covered everything we we planned to talk about. It, uh, it again. It's so exciting. It's I have loved watching this project unfold, especially how far you've come in the last. It's probably I guess been four years since we recorded the last episode, which is kind of weird to even say how fast those four years went by. But it uh, <laughs> there's so much happening, and it's just it sounds like there, it's very exciting, and it's it's cool to to watch the project develop. Like I said, can you let everybody know where they can find more information about Arc, any of the social media, or the website, and whatnot? Sure. And I just sort of wanted to end on, on a positive note too, because we've talked about a lot of, you know, negative stuff. And I just wanted to, I, I have so much hope for our future. Um, I think there's starting to be a shift in how we, we relate to nature and that people are starting to realize we got to stop destroying forests, especially the Amazon rainforest. And we, we need to pressure the governments and, and, and head of corporations to not only take um, into account the economic growth, but also the environment and human health. And I think we're starting to see a shift that way. So uh, there's still time. There's definitely still time to to save the Amazon and, and our future doesn't have to be one of a story of extinctions and and pandemics, et cetera. Um, I, I think it's a, a re- that's a really good point too, is people are realizing the health benefits of being in nature. Not maybe not going yes. traveling to the Amazon. Of course, that's a huge thing. But just being outside, being in your just own being backyard, and, and being in a forest, and it's it's just so important that we don't turn everything into a a farm or a, a city. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Nature provides us with so much, uh, so many benefits. So many benefits, yeah. not just physically and, and mentally, emotionally. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But as far as we can find us, uh, we have a website which is arconservancy.com or amazonrainforestconservancy.com. Um, and I really try and, and update the website on a regular basis. I also send out a monthly newsletter so people could sign up on the website to, to get the monthly newsletter. And they can also go on that we've got a tab there that's called Newsroom and it also shows all the, the monthly newsletters that come out. Uh, we're also on Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, TikTok, we're trying to be everywhere. Mm-hmm. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, because once a week I try and post a really interesting social media and I've got a great, oh my gosh, I, I'm so fortunate. Um, up here in Canada, um, uh, Quake Marketing uh, helps me uh, with with um, social media posts. And then I've got one of our board directors, Mark, is the most amazing cameraman and editor. And he usually comes down with me to Peru and takes a lot of the footage that we can then use uh, well, to show up here in Canada. So I, I'm just, I have just such an amazing group of people around me here in Canada and Peru. Yeah. Well, I think people like to be part of projects that have a good, strong leader and someone who's actually passionate and excited about that. So it's probably not a coincidence that you've cultivated such a great team to help you with all that. And <laughs> and I'll make sure that everything's in the show notes as far as the links and whatnot. And I really encourage everybody to go go check it out. And and we'll definitely record another one at some point in the future. We won't wait four years this time. We'll do another one sooner. Because oh, I, yes. Because I, I have so to, many good stories. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would love to get all the stories and, and more updates okay. and whatnot. And so until then, Jenna, thank you so much for not only coming on the podcast again, but also doing the work that you're doing because it's just amazing to hear about. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Dylan, for having me as a guest and also for your support. Really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. All right. That is the end of that episode. Jana, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. And like I said at the end, thank you for the work that you're doing. It it would be impossible to listen to this episode and think that you're not passionate about what you're doing because you have a smile on your face the entire time. And you, I can see how important this work is for you. And I think We need people in the world like yourself who are doing this. So thank you so much. As I said, I'm super proud that the podcast has been able to make even a small difference in the charity. We are collecting donations. Slowly, that total donation is growing. And I'm just so excited the fact that we can take a group of people who are incredibly passionate about the welfare of animals and can convert that enthusiasm and passion into actual conservation. And that is just so exciting for me. And and so I'm, I'm very thankful that ARC has given me the opportunity to do that with the podcast. Listeners, if you enjoyed the podcast, podcast, share it. Let's get this one on lots of listeners. We want to make sure people are aware of who Amazon Rainforest Conservancy is, who Janabelle is, and we want 
people to be aware of the projects that they're working on and how exciting the future is for this charity. I cannot wait to see how those projects that she talked about in the episode develop. It's going to be a very exciting time. If you're looking for more information on the podcast, animalsathomenetwork.com is your place. Thank you so much to Custom Reptile Habitats for sponsoring this podcast. If you're looking for new reptile enclosures, make sure you head to the affiliate link in both the show notes or the YouTube description. Like I said, that is an affiliate link. So if you do make a purchase, a small commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you. If you would like to help support the show on a monthly basis, you can do that over at patreon.com slash animals at home. All the support there is greatly appreciated. As I said in the intro, it, the show would not exist without the, the support through Patreon. So thank you so much. And I will see you guys in the next episode. 